In the meantime, our newsmaker of the hour is Indra Nui. She is the PepsiCo chairman and CEO. And Indra, we are very pleased to have you here. Thank you for being here. Becky, Joe, Andrew, Bill George, great to be with you and Happy New Year to all of you. Happy New Year to you. Andrew, I know you wanted to come on today and talk a little bit about leadership. That's why uh, Bill had brought you here today as well. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your plan, about what it does take, you think, to deliver corporate performance and to have this while positioning the company for sustainable long-term growth? You know, in today's, t in today's world, which is, you know, extremely volatile, extremely complex, I think it requires enormous courage, enormous stamina, and a board that's completely aligned with the CEO but still practices great governance in that they're objective but still uh, represent the shareholders and have a great uh, rapport and dialogue with the uh, CEO and the company. These are not easy times, Becky, because uh, you know, the world has gone from a 4-plus GDP growth to a 3% GDP growth. The composition of countries in that growth has changed. You've got enormous issues from a geopolitical issue. You've got climate change issues. CEOs are having to deliver performance by powering through all of these issues and do it at a time when you can no longer manage a company just for duration. You've also got to manage it for level of returns. Uh, so it really uh, requires stamina and courage to be able to navigate through all these incredibly difficult uh, forces that are really impacting corporations and CEOs today. I know you can't talk about uh, your results, but you're in a quiet period right now. But I would like to ask you just about the global economy. We've had a lot of people mm. who have been looking around. They look at the U.S. economy and things look to be improving. Have you seen that? And what do you see around the globe? You know, I tell you, uh, as I said, the GDP growth of the world has definitely come down from, you know, the 2004 to 6 period. But as I look at 2012 going into 2014, 2013, 2014, we are seeing a gradual improvement in all the economies. The U.S., clearly, we are seeing some improvement in the fundamentals of the economy. The composition of it is different. We'll come to that in a second. But the underlying economy is improving. Uh, if you go down to uh, Latin America, uh, I think Mexico is doing well. Brazil is a bit slow, but I think Brazil will come you know, into its own as the World Cup comes in and the economy starts to stimulate itself again. Uh, the Eurozone versus last year, we're actually expecting to see a bit of an improvement this year, which is good news. Um, the Eastern European bloc, including Russia, about a 3% GDP growth, which, you know, is a good number for that uh, bloc. So we're quite happy with it. The Middle East uh, and those economies, about 5% GDP growth, pretty good. Uh, I think the China-India aspect, that part of the world, uh, you know, China used to have 9, 10 GDP growth. India used to have 8% GDP growth, which is really what India needs to get out of chronic underemployment. I think the growth rates in those countries have come down just a bit. Uh, and Africa is still in the 5 to 6 percent. So as you look around the world, this composition leads to an overall GDP growth rate, which is a point below where we'd like the global GDP growth rate to be at. But companies have to figure out how to power through GDP growth, whether it's 4 percent or 3 percent or 2 percent. So we have to have geographic scope, product scope to be able to play the portfolio game, the product uh, you know, options game, to make sure that we can deliver results in spite of this global um, you know, confusion that's going on. Good morning. It's Bill. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, on this last point, uh, uh, we had Toby Cosgrove on earlier, and he was talking about mm -hmm. the obesity epidemic. And if you go all the way back, I believe, to the fall of 2006, when you became CEO, you foresaw these changes coming in terms of consumer uh, eating and drinking habits and you put some markers in place to try to if you will morph your strategy or build your strategy how's that playing out now here we're some seven years later how's that playing out for you and what do you anticipate looking forward for the next two three four years in terms of how you're going to handle that and what's really going to happen what is pepsico doing specifically to build its growth uh, so that you can sustain growth because that is really the long-term goal that you have as CEO. Absolutely. Bill, that's a great question. I tell you, when I became CEO in 2006, uh, if you looked at the public projections of the growth rate of the carbonated soft drink category or the snacks category, especially the savory snacks category, everybody was forecasting boom times, you know, 5, 6, 7 percent growth. And even in the United States, people were forecasting three and four percent growth for the carbonated soft drink category. That's the forecasters were using mathematical models. 
But if you really dug underneath that and looked at the public policy debates going on, the consumer chatter going on, what uh, hospitals were talking about, the trend was going to be different. And that's what made me jump into action and say, look, we have to start transforming our portfolio for the trend that's coming that you know, really is based on deep analytics, not a trend right. based on uh, just a projection of a line. And when I looked at that, I realized that PepsiCo, which is a big, iconic American company, you know, now participating in the whole world, had to transform its portfolio because our portfolio was more fun for you products. So the strategy was very simple. We said, let's reduce the salt, sugar, fat in our fun for you products. Let's dial up the zero calorie products. And let's really lean into the good for you products, but make the good for you products with positive nutrition right. taste great. So that no consumer had to make a choice between taste and health or price and health. You know, you don't have to pay more for a good for you product. This transformation, I'd say, was an extremely difficult transformation for two simple reasons. We were taking the culture of a company that had been around for decades and asking all of ourselves in the company to fundamentally change how we think about our products. But the reason it was even more difficult than just the change management inside the company was that right. I had too many critics outside the company. Uh, everybody kept telling me that I was not proud of my categories, that I had to focus more on salt, f uh, sh uh, fat, and sugar. You know, there were just far too many critics. Fighting Andrew, the outside critics was more difficult than transforming the company. Andrew, I think today we've crossed that, you know, crossed that. Yeah, you overcame that a couple of years well, ago mm -hmm. with some of the changes. Well, I think, I, I think, though, it's fair that, that we asked a couple of questions, though, uh, about the critics. So, you know, there is this lingering question about whether the company should be one. You talk about the power of one uh, and whether it should be split up. Is there any specific data that you can point to that suggests that Frito-Lay has helped increase the growth rate of the carbonated uh, of the carbonated drinks because if you look at a number of analyst reports it, it's hard it's hard to suggest or hard to get there and it i was hoping that you might have some data that thirsty. gets you there. <laughs> it may make it may make you thirsty but it th makes you th it's Let not that sounds like peanut butter and jelly it's a, it's a fair question let her answer the question so let me go through joe you're a big consumer of frito lay products anytime Cheetos. you eat a frito lay product fritos in particular in no. fact fritos let's talk about that if you eat a bag of Fritos, do you reach for a beverage? Yes. I think you do. When you go to a tailgate party, do you take <laughs> snacks and beverages together? Absolutely. When you sit down to watch a game, do you have snacks and beverages? Yes. These two go together. They are better together, whatever you say. Now, hey. does the growth rate help each other? Absolutely. Look, in the United States, when you really think about the big holidays, Going to the retailer and talking about putting the two together drives traffic, drives ticket. Let me tell you another one. When retailers have a slowdown in sales, the first person they call is PepsiCo because we are large, we are right. high velocity categories, and they say, come in and tell us what you can do to do some more lobby displays, do some promotions in the perimeter so we can get the traffic in and start getting the sales up. So I right. think that... These two categories are better together, Andrew, not just in the United States, around the world. Well, let me ask you about that around the world, because when you think about the fastest growing markets in the world uh, for your business, uh, invariably you think of China, you think of Mexico. You reached uh, mm -hmm. bottling deals in both of those countries in 2011, uh, which uh, Nelson Peltz has publicly said uh, that you mortgaged uh, the company's future and you have divided the Frito-Lay business from them so you can't get the synergies. What do you say to that? Um, I wish people would go in and see how we run those businesses. And I hope this is not a conversation about anything but leadership, but let me come to that. If you look at China, our whole business, the marketing, how we think about the products, all of that is done together. I was in China two months ago, Chairman Wei, the chairman of Ting Yi, who is our partner in beverages. You know, we worked very closely together on what innovation pipeline, what do we do together with foods and beverages. The businesses work well together. The reason we franchised the business in China to Tingyi is because they were ahead of us in a manufacturing footprint and a distribution right. footprint. So it made sense to partner with them. Look, what we are deploying is sensible strategies. At the end of the day, the products work together. In right. fact, China is the only country in the world where the advertising campaign you know, for Chinese New Year, has Pepsi, Tropicana, and Lay's in the same commercial. 
And uh, I think China is an example of better together at its best. Right. Yeah. How, do, how, do you, wait, how do you think about this, though? You know, and people have, analysts have said this, others have said this. When you look at the, the total shareholder return of the company since you joined 2006 on an annual basis, 7%. Consumer staples, 11 percent. Coca-Cola, 12 percent. And I know you, uh, part of that is probably investing in changing a lot of the mix. But, but do you think it's more than that? Do you think it has anything to do with the structure at all? Okay, Andrew, this is where I think it's very, very important that you look at the right time frames because you pick any time frame you want for any company, you can make them look good or bad. In fact, I can say in the last year, our total shareholder return is twice that of our principal competitor. But let me go back. From 1997 to 2006, the other beverage company went through a massive meltdown, went through four CEOs, a massive meltdown. At that point, we were doing very well. They took a gigantic reset, and they started coming out of it. PepsiCo has been a steady performer over that time. So why don't you look at our 10-year returns? They're phenomenal. So I look at this issue in terms of how do you manage a company for duration of returns, not do a boom splat. Because I think the worst thing a CEO can do is to manage the company for five years of returns. You know, it's like, uh, you know, this cartoon where the guy runs and then stops. We can't do that. We've got to manage this company for a steady growth in performance, not a boom splat. Okay. okay. In, in your last I, question, I don't subscribe to that, uh, to that approach. In, in okay. Andrew, thank you for joining us, and, and let thank me say you. thank you for, uh, for, for answering yeah. some of these uh, questions candidly and, and forthrightly, and, and I know uh, some of them are tough, but, and I know but people, it, it, people do want to know. It so, took a Yale it. studio to get you on, and you know, George can <laughs> handle it at Harvard. Thank you so, for your leadership, uh, yeah. Indra, and thank I hope you. at the end of the day we're going to help get at some of these problems thanks to your leadership. Simon Feld wanted to point that out, that you thank were unable you. to come up with a studio. It had to be at Yale, even though you're at Harvard, right? A Yale had to come through. Anyway, still to come, the